thing I often do to talk about developing your own leadership style and tips for leaders. And I want to run through that right quick just because I want folks to think about what this means to them. The most important thing a leader can do first is to know herself, to take time to reacquaint yourself with yourself, know what excites you and what ticks you off. How much work are you prepared to do to lead? Know if you're a leader that everyone has buttons and how you cover yours up as opposed to letting them go out there. Secondly, embrace yourself. Not only know yourself, but get to like yourself a lot. Because all of us are imperfect people, but there's stuff about your leadership style that you ought to fall in love with. I'm bold. I'm uh, off the cuff. It gets me in trouble sometimes. Uh, it gets me in trouble a lot of times. But it's actually kind of interesting. I like it, and so I just sort of say to people, okay, uh, I'm going to try not to leave the reservation, but I, if I do, you know, send somebody out to get me. But the fact is that I don't mind acknowledging who I am. None of us should acknowledge who we are and what we bring to the table. So the best thing for me is to be in a room full of folks who are not necessarily off the cuff to help structure that which is going to happen. Know your context. One of the most important things is so gratifying to see this group of people and all the companies that have um, sponsored this conference, but I bet you every company has a different culture. And so all of us need to know the culture that we're working in. What kind of corporate culture is it? How does the status of women affect you in your space? If you're at a company where you've got a, you know, a wonderful woman like Adrienne in leadership, you know, it might, it's probably going to be a little bit more compatible for women than if you've got a company where you look up and the top, you know, the C-suite doesn't have any women in it at all. Or the C-suite doesn't even have a ladies' bathroom. Now, this is often a signal. When they say, okay, I heard someone say, you can use the men's room, but what if the only rooms are men's rooms? I mean, I had the opportunity to re-attend my undergraduate school. I went back for, uh, I don't know, Black History Month, I guess. I went back because it was kind of a reunion, and we were in Gaston Hall at Boston College. Now, Gaston Hall used to be the business building. Well, I didn't realize this until I went back. My class was the first class at Boston College to admit women to arts and science and business. And it was class of 74. It wasn't that long ago. And I re distinctly remember this business uh, ethics class where the man, the little man would, and I said little man because he got on my nerves. When I came in the class, <laughs> it was myself and a white woman named Linda, and he made us sit in the front. And he would say, good morning, gentlemen, Julian, Linda. So he, I mean, we constantly felt put on the spot. And then he, if we had our hands up, he'd wait for every guy to talk. And he'd say, I guess you ladies wouldn't have anything to add to the conversation. You know, you just wanted to sort of take him outside with a paper bag. But <laughs> it all came flooding back when I was sitting at this, this Black History Month celebration. I asked one of the students, could you kindly take me to the restroom? And she says, well, there's, one in the, there's a women's room in the basement. So I went to classes in that building for four years, and basically I remembered never wanted to go into the basement, so I timed myself to use the restroom at times where I would not be in that building. Well, they were sending a signal. Now, Boston College has changed. It's a great place. They've even had a woman dean of the business school. But the fact is that some time ago, it was closed to women's participation. So look at the signs around you and look at the folks around you and what they're prepared to say to support and defend you. Knowing your context is really important. Understand your bottom line. We had a great conversation this morning about um, what happens when you say something, nobody heard you, and then you go around the room and the guy says it. They go, oh, brilliant idea. We've all had that experience at one time or another. Some of us are having it less these days. I guess if I'm in charge, nobody's going to say they didn't hear me, huh? Um, it's not going to turn out right. But the point is that there's a time to holler and there's a time to let it go. Know how much you're willing to accept. Know what your bottom line is and understand what your bottom line is. Know what you want folks to say about you. Reputation management is part of leadership style. Who do you talk to? Who do you respond to? Whose calls do you return? What do you say when you're away from the camera? Surround yourself with good people, 360. Bosses, peers, and mentees. When you nurture, you nurture others, you develop your own leadership style. Network, network, network. That was seven. Ideas are in the universe, and you can actually get food for thought from virtually anywhere. Don't get so busy that you don't expose yourself to the marketplace of ideas, the people presenting them, and the ways that others can help you realize your dream. Act like the leader you want to be. Too many of us are waiting for a moment to be anointed as a leader or appointed as a leader. But what if we acted the part until it fit our skin? What if we looked around at leaders that we thought were successful and took the time to spend a few minutes with them and modeled some of their attributes? It would make a big difference in the ways that you're then perceived and move up. 
Study leadership theory, techniques, and methods. If you believe that leaders are developed and not born, then embrace your development as a long, lifelong commitment. Read about leadership. Go to workshops. Read about others in your field. Embrace the concept of sharpening the saw. Lead by walking around. Get out of the office, out of the silos, out of the traditional chain of command. You can learn from your direct reports, but also from people who are serving food, answering phones, and playing invisible roles. Have conversations about what's going on, and not with the people that you always talk to. Think about other folks that you might have conversations with that will help you develop your style. Consider the source when it comes to criticism. People will talk, and you probably ought to listen sometimes, but you don't have to internalize it. Some of our challenges that we're afraid to be criticized, but we can learn from just about anybody, so listen, and then move on. Thank you for sharing that with me. Strive for balance. Broken vessels leak. Unrefreshed leaders make mistakes. Your leadership style is enhanced by your ability to get out of yourself, to sharpen the saw, and to develop relationships that have absolutely nothing to do with your work. You know, I, gave, I listed 12 tips for leaders, but number 13 comes from Katherine Hepburn. She said, if you obey all the rules, you'll miss all the fun. So <laughs> while indeed many of us have developed leadership rules, leadership thoughts, and leadership ideas, the most important thing for you is to make it work for you. But to understand those words of Ntozaki Shange, an African-American woman whose play uh, went to Broadway for colored girls who considered suicide when the rainbow was enough, there's a line in the play. She said, I saw God in myself, and I loved her fiercely. I saw God in myself, and I loved her deeply. Part of this leadership thing is about being OK with you, about be really being OK with you, so OK with you that you know that you can make a mistake, and it's OK that you're going to put some things out there that are going to thud, but that you're going to put enough things out there that are going to be interesting, exciting, and phenomenal. Interesting, exciting, and phenomenal that you're willing to take the risk. This is a really important time, again, in our nation when we look at the things that we have to deal with around issues of leadership. I don't care what sector you go in. We're besieged by examples of immorality and lack of ethics. We see people basically stealing in our faces or stealing behind our backs and calling it in our faces. I won't call any companies out by name. I know they're not here, but I still will attempt to be diplomatic for just a few seconds today. But here's the point. We know that whether we're talking about work and family issues, whether we're talking about our economy, whether we're talking about our international context, that there are things that have not been put on the table. I cringe when I look at our economy and what we expect to be up against in the next 15 years. The White House has said that the unemployment rate will probably not drop to 6% until about 2015. So that means five more years of very high unemployment. Where will our leaders be to talk about investing in small businesses, which is where most of our jobs are coming from, our new economic engine? Where will our leaders be to talk about issues of equity around women? Where will our leaders be to talk about issues of job creation? We're not going to get out of the situation automatically, accidentally, the fact is that people aren't spending because people aren't spending. In other words, companies aren't putting money into inventory or production because they don't see the consumer confidence coming up. We women have enormous power when we look at markets. Many of the things that we do are counterindicated to our own interests. You know, we have something in America I call sports shopping. Okay, you feel good, you buy. Right? You feel like I'm going shopping, I feel so good. You feel bad, you buy. I feel so bad, I'm going shopping. You know, you get a new relationship, you have to get new car, no clothes for your new, I just met this great guy, I'm going shopping. You break up with the guy. You have to get more new clothes because you don't want to wear the clothes that reminded you of that other guy. So you go going shopping. Every time I get a road trip, someone says to me, what are you going to bring me back? I'm like, me. You know, I'm not stopping. I mean, with all due respect to Omaha, and I'll probably leave a few dollars here. That's what we do as Americans. But I'm not taking 10 magnets from the airport store back to Greensboro that say Omaha. And does anybody really need them? Well, we are sometimes the one. He's looking at his bag. You have a magnet, dude? <laughs> but we women are often the ones who set the standards for how we shop. We've got to teach our daughters and tell our daughters that there are other things that we need to do besides shop. Because when we look at some of the issues around Social Security and pensions and other things, 
What we understand is that a dollar spent today is a dollar that's not saved, that our nation will not be able to manage that system indefinitely, that we again can have the kind of leadership that says, no, you don't need something new every time you go somewhere. Begin to do some, some of that kind of recycling. This is economic power. But some of those conversations will come, I think, from women. And they will come when women feel comfortable enough to say something like that without fearing that others will say, well, just a minute. You know, Marianne Williams is, Williamson is one of my favorite people. People credited Nelson Mandela with saying some things but that she said. She said, our deepest fear is that not, not that we're inadequate, our deepest fear is that we're powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, talented, gorgeous, and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. All of us has a goddess in us dying to come out and do some things. It might not be to lead a corporation or a college or an organization. It might just be to lead the three or four people who are around you into coming up with a better workplace solution. Or leading your neighbors, and so many women have gotten started in politics with the street sign. I mean, it actually is, I don't know how many people back in my media days I interviewed, but one um, that strikes me is Harriet Wood, who's a former lieutenant governor of Missouri. Do you know how she got started in politics? A kid was hit by a car in her neighborhood, and there was no stop sign. She learned about politics because she was determined that there should be a stop sign. She didn't know, she said, that she was a leader until she got angry about that stop sign and decided that she could do something about it. We all have a slice of Harriet Wood in us, a slice of Hillary Clinton in us, a slice, yes, even of Sarah Palin in us. Our challenge was small, in my case, no slice, but <laughs> I took Hillary. But, uh, but her, I, I admire her audacity. I really do. I, and I admire the fact that she's willing to step up to a sexist stage and still put her stuff out there. And the fact is all of us have to be willing to stand up and put it out there and then to look back to see if anybody's following. Again, Malvo 101, if you think you're leading and you look back to find nobody following, you're not leading, you're just tripping. <laughs> My point, as Ellen DeGeneres would say, and she says, the point, and there is one, the point is this. You must awaken the leader in you, not only for your own self-fulfillment, but also for the positive outcome of our entire nation. Thank you very much.